Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Sandy Forsyth. I'm the minister here at Mayfield Salisbury. In the Church of Scotland's Life and Work magazine in May 1989, there was an article by the editor introducing the incoming moderator of the General Assembly by quoting words spoken about him at Edinburgh University when he received an honorary doctorate. It was said that he had a zest and lightness of touch which kindle and retain interest, a tact and sensitivity, humor and compassion which inspire confidence and cooperation. This, of course, was Bill MacDonald. It's my privilege to be a successor of Bill's at Mayfield Salisbury, where he was minister from 1959 to 1992, and where his influence still resonates strongly. In the article, Bill described himself as a liberal evangelical. In other words, he believed in the core truths of the Christian faith, and he was passionate about setting them in the context of a parish to work amongst people and in community engagement. But yet he had no narrow-minded view of doctrine and was open to a broad range of scholarship. His was a generous understanding based on tolerance and respect, summed up in his desire that he stated in that article for his moditorial year of recognizing common ground amongst Christians and bringing them together no matter their theological persuasion. Bill's broad-mindedness was born of a strong intellectual capacity and his knowledge of the arts and of history. He exemplified all that is good in the educated and compassionate parish minister. And so this lecture series was established in Bill's honor to celebrate his life and his ministry and his own dedication to education and to compassion. Having been delayed by a year due to the pandemic, I'm delighted to welcome everyone this evening to Mayfield Salisbury, both those of you who are here in person and those of you who are online on live stream, welcome to you too. And especially, it's good to welcome Patricia and the MacDonald family. This is the second Bill MacDonald lecture. The inaugural one was in October 2018 by Alan Little, a personal reflection by Alan on his own work called Young Men and War. And the current invitation to Dr. Dennis Rutovitz recognizes Dennis's 30 years with Embra Direct Aid and all the considerable work that he has put into it. After Dennis's lecture, there'll be a chance for a Q&A, so please do keep in mind all questions you might have for Dennis as he speaks. But for now, it's my pleasure to welcome you and to invite Alan to speak more of Bill and to introduce Dennis tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Um, my father-in-law, Bill MacDonald, came to what was then Mayfield Parish Church in 1959 and served this parish as its minister for 33 years. Not quite without interruption, as you say, because he did one year as moderator of the General Assembly. Uh, he was happy to serve the country in that capacity, although he was a little dismayed, I think, when, he, when one newspaper reported his appointment as moderator under the headline, TV Sheena's dad gets top Kirk job. <laughs> I only came to know him after he retired, and I regret that I never heard him preach. And many of you will remember him as a very fine preacher, one of the greatest of his age. Uh, many of you will remember the day the roof burned off this church as well, and the young minister dashing in through the flames to rescue this, the silver, the silverware in the church. It was a very dramatic time. At uh, Bill's memorial service in this very church almost six years ago, one of his successors as minister here, Scott McKenna, said that Bill had given him as a young minister some uh, two pieces of advice about the conducting of funerals. First, he said, when you go to visit the bereaved family, polish your shoes. It's a matter of respect. And secondly, don't turn up on time. Be a little bit late. The family will have been running around the house frantically getting things tidy and respectable for the minister's visit and being late will give them a few minutes just to gather themselves before you ring their bell. So these small things are typical, I think, of the man that I came to know, a man I think of, of uh, as a man of immense compassion and a wonderful ability to think himself into the hearts and minds of others, especially those under his personal, uh, under his pastoral care. Sheena and I have frequently been recognized in the street by strangers in London as well as in Edinburgh to be told how much they owe to Bill's quiet, considered generosity. 
at the most profoundly difficult periods of their lives. I want to share one memory with you. Uh, not long after Bill died, I got a letter from a man in England. This is the story he told me. When I was 14, he said, I went blind, and my parents enrolled me at the blind school in Edinburgh. I learned Braille, I did well at my studies, and took my hires, and I said I wanted to go to Edinburgh University to study history. Everybody told me it was impossible, that there was too much reading to be done, and that there was almost nothing in Braille. I persisted, though, and I got in, and very soon I discovered that they were right. I could not keep up with the other students. There was too much reading, and there was almost nothing in Braille. The blind school hostel was very near Mayfield Church, he said, and in despair, although I was not a Christian, I knocked on the church door, and the young minister, Bill MacDonald, happened to be here. It was 1959, so Bill would have been in the first few months of his ministry here. I told him my predicament. He said, leave it with me for a few days. Come back on Tuesday. And when I went back, he had recruited a team of readers from among his congregation. They read aloud, and I took notes in Braille, and they stayed with me for four years. I took a first... <coughs> I always find this quite difficult to, to say without choking. I took a first-class honours degree and went to Oxford to take my PhD and had a career as a professor of history. That is, that is living the mission. That is faith in the community, changing people's lives. So this is why I felt very privileged to have been asked to honor Bill's memory by giving the inaugural Bill MacDonald lecture a few years ago, and why it's an even greater privilege to introduce our speaker tonight. I first came across Dr. Dennis Rutovitz when I was a relatively young reporter working in Bosnia in the early 1990s. I hadn't expected to become a war reporter, least of all in Europe, a continent that I believed had found a way of living without war, thanks to the generation that fought and sacrificed so much in the Second World War, a conflict that Bill fought in himself as a young captain in the Indian Army, an experience which I think changed his life and which launched his life of public service a life of extraordinary devotion to others and a good life well lived. Which is why Dennis is the right person to speak in Bill's memory tonight, for his too is the life of a good man, well and generously lived. Dennis had a very distinguished career as a mathematician, uh, as a, an early pioneer of information technology. He retired in 1993 as assistant director of the MSC Human Genetics Unit Nobody would have blamed him at that point for putting his feet up and enjoying life. But instead, he decided in retirement to go to the most dangerous place in the world. In 1992, he founded Edinburgh Direct Aid. For three years, he led most of the charity's aid convoys into Bosnia himself, coming under fire in Sarajevo, and on one occasion being wounded. I remember myself how terrifying driving up what the the main drag that we used to call Sniper Alley was, and Dennis was no stranger to it. That didn't deter him. After the war in Bosnia ended in 1996, uh, Edinburgh Direct Aid has continued to provide aid all over the world in Kosovo, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Kenya, and elsewhere, not just as relief from the effects of war, but after major natural disasters like tsunamis, earthquakes, and floods. More recently, Edinburgh Direct Aid has been focused on the plight of Syrian refugees, not only providing emergency aid, but also providing vocational training for many of the dispossessed young. He's a very inspiring man. I've seen for myself how Dennis's work has carried the name of our city around the world and how countless people come to associate the name of Edinburgh with compassion, decency, and the idea of a shared humanity. Please welcome this year's Bill MacDonald Memorial Lecturer, Dennis Rutovitz. Well, thank you, Alan. I think you've really said all, all that I have to say, but I'll add a few words. Um,
It's a great honor to be asked to give this lecture. Um, in truth, I did not know much about Bill MacDonald, but I had learned to have great respect for Sheena and for Alan. Though the more I found out about Bill MacDonald, the more I understand the desire to commemorate him and the more inadequate and honored I feel to be part of that commemoration. My topic tonight, I think I put the, he I put the headline on, as aid work is not beatitude. According to the Merriam-Webster definition of beatitude, it's a state of the utmost bliss. It also carries with it an implication of moral righteousness. And I gather there are eight variants of being righteous. But I would like now to tell you the story of Edinburgh Direct Aid in a way which I think will make it clear that aid work can involve difficult moral conflicts. It's by no means always obviously righteous. Let's go back now to 1992, as Alan has already intimated. The component parts of Yugoslavia are breaking away and Serbia is trying to force them to stay. Bosnia is being torn three ways, towards Croatia by the Catholics of Herzegovina, the Croats towards Serbia by the Orthodox to the north and west of Bosnia and towards a Bosniak multi-ethnic state by most of the Muslims for whom this was the only possible solution. And also by the more educated and aware components of the population, mainly in Sarajevo. Croat and Serb are entangled in bloody encounters in parts of Croatia adjoining Serbia and northwest Bosnia. And Zagreb, the Croatian center, is cut off from Split and Dubrovnik in the southwest in Dalmatia. Ethnic cleansing is happening. For the first time since the 1940s, cattle trucks filled with unfortunate are rolling towards concentration camps. The unfortunate being Muslim is not Jews this time. In some small towns, rivers fill with the bodies of the executed. Cities which resist are under siege and bombardment. Our government of the time takes the line that it's all a long way away, a civil war, not our concern. The subtext being that these people are always killing each other anyway, which filled me with anger, righteous anger if you like, and the feeling that if the government wouldn't do anything about it, the people should have a try. Jeanne agreed with me. And so, in August 1992, a two-car convoy set off from Edinburgh, seen off by Andrew McClellan and the congregation of St. Andrew and St. George's. We had trailers filled with, many, with mainly medical goods, destination Zagreb and the nearby refugee camps, which was how Edinburgh Direct Aid was conceived, if not quite born. This was Jeanne and my first see-it-for-yourself exposure to what was happening there in the form of a tour around some of the ethnically cleansed areas of Croatia on the road to Vukovar. Goods would, <clears throat> in that area, we met a Croatian doctor who lived, she thought securely, with a Serb husband and her children until one night he disappeared to join the Serb irregulars destroying Croatian villages. And that was a story we heard over and over again. However, our goods were delivered to hospitals providing services to refugees. Contacts were made. We were welcomed by the then Cardinal in Zagreb and everyone else. That first trip was, if not quite bliss, it was on the whole an aid workers feel good event. On our return to Edinburgh, there was general enthusiasm, a great wish to be involved. 
So the trip was not a one-off as we had imagined it would be, but the first of many. And so Edinburgh Direct Aid was born. In the following months, several other convoys drove, drove to Bosnia, this time under the flag of Edinburgh Direct Aid, with more and bigger vehicles and an assortment of volunteers as crew. I have to say, though, we did not feel particularly righteous. We enjoyed meeting the British soldiers and other components of the UN force which had been sent out on a mandate to protect aid workers, but not much else. Sometimes we were frightened, of course, by the sound of shell fire or occasionally nearby crossfire, but by and large, we felt adventurous. We laughed, we joked, we teased. Until, that is, we were brought up short by actual contact with those we were trying to help. I will always remember the first time that we were led by squaddies to a village which had been cut off by hostile forces, and we started distributing the boxes which we brought in our trucks, with some staple foods, some clothes, some toiletries. The villagers quickly gathered round the trucks and queued for our handouts. I did not feel righteous. All I felt was shame for their shame. <clears throat> These were sturdy, independent people who'd been reduced in the last few months by their fear of what might yet befall them and their general want of everything, to queuing to get some comfort from whatever might be in the boxes which might help them or not. Later, we found better ways of distributing aid, but I've never found the role of benevolent, dollar, of benevolent donor in the least comfortable. In December that year, <coughs> we took our first convoy to Sarajevo. That was an order of magnitude different experience from anything we'd done before. Negotiating with hostile, hostile forces surrounding, crossing their lines, and then sharing for some days the experiences of Sarajevo in the Kosovo hospital where we delivered our goods. No electricity except that which we contrived for the most critical of hospital services. No running water, a room made avail available for our volunteers to sleep in, adjacent to a non-flushing toilet, at least provided a feeling of shelter. Nevertheless, our welcome was amazing. Some of who we met there became long-term friends and associates, and we were even welcomed by Cardinal Pulic, who mentioned us in his Christmas Day address when we went down to the cathedral next day. It was a good trip to Sarajevo. And despite complications of every sort, we returned buoyed up, feeling, if not quite blissful, that we had definitely done the right thing. Six months later, our third convoy to Sarajevo. Three trucks, medical supplies, food, toiletries, clothing. All deliveries now in the capable, friendly, and fearless charge of one, of one Maureen Lyons, a wonderful London, Londoner who had married to Fadil Cherkis, a Bosnian doctor, and she was in charge of UNHCR Social Services Department in Sarajevo. Maureen arranged warehousing, guided us to delivery destinations, and delivered warehoused, warehoused items later to best effect. Christine and Alan Whitcutt were amongst the volunteers in this trip, which included many experiences. In particular, I remember an evening watching the stars and occasional flashes of mortar fire from the side opposite as we sat in the dark on a terrace and one of Maureen and Fadil's neighbors, buoyed up by a feeling of accomplishment and friendly solidarity with our hosts. We left a few days later and disaster struck. As I led the convoy in a Land Rover down the so-called Sniper's Alley, a message came over the radio that Christine had been hit. We stopped under an underpass for shelter, and Alan cried, Christine's arm, as we opened the truck door, but it was not the arm that mattered. The bullet had gone right, th <clears throat> right through it and into Christine's chest and heart.
One of the Beatitudes I've read is, blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I think that in the years to come, Alan did derive comfort from the aid work he continued to do. And he gave much comfort to all in Edinburgh aid by his unswerving assertion that he and Christine had understood the risks and taken them willingly. But notwithstanding Alan's comfort, <clears throat> my portion was not beatitude, but guilt and doubt. What right had I <clears throat> to persuade and lead others into mortal danger? Yes, the risks were explained and consent obtained, <clears throat> both in words and in writing. Assuaged to some extent by Alan and by general support, I and EDA carried on, but the doubt remained and remains. EDA continued. Eight convoys now comprised up to about 10 vehicles, including seriously big HGVs. Supplies were either donated in UK or bought locally and split for repeated runs after delivering the initial load. Volunteers were never short. The response to Christine's death was, was to increase, not decrease the number of those willing to go out, if not always the most suitable. There were incidents aplenty, but the banter and the teasing in between the danger and the deliveries returned, such as, well, I could recount many incidents. Brian Horn, an evening news journalist who had been on Christine's convoy, on one later occasion went to relieve himself in a wooded patch by the roadside. He was rudely interrupted when one of us managed to decode the sign in Sobo Croat which said, danger, mines. Needless to say, Brian retraced his steps rather caref carefully and much hilarity ensued. In mid-1994, a convoy going down the road from Mount Ignan, Igman, the then available crossing into Sarajevo, came under fire. I was in the lead Land Rover, driven at that time by David Reeks, and of a sudden had the impression that I'd been kicked by a horse in the chest, which turned out to be a machine gun bullet partially, partially deflected by my flak jacket. Another truck, driven by Andy Sutherland, was hit and went off the steep mountain road, stopped upside down. Andy crawled out the cab and then went back to get the papers while machine gun and mortar fire continued. When we reached the bottom of the road, French Amprefort loaded me into an ambulance, took me to hospital. But they declined to send an armored Land Rover to fetch Andy, so instead two of our, two of our volunteers drove up and up in an unprotected Land Rover under continuing fire to fetch him and succeeded. I was looked after very well by the surgeons in the military hospital in Sarajevo and the next day was flown out to Zagreb and put into a US military hospital at the airport. It could have come straight out of MASH. If anybody here can remember the film MASH, it was a very funny film and the hospital was in its way quite comical but very good. Jeanne met me at the airport a few days later. And if I remember right, her first words on meeting me, on seeing me, were, it's wonderful to see that you're okay, but I'm so glad that it was you who was hit and not anyone else. <laughs> I knew exactly what she meant and felt exactly the same myself. When hostility ceased in Bosnia with the Dayton Agreement, EDA began helping Bosnian refugees in Scotland and the wider UK to return home if they wanted to. But often enough, there was not much home left, which turned EDA onto a new path, house repair and reconstruction. Our first venture, repairing houses around Kluge, where many Edinburgh refugees had come from, was led by one Liz McLaughlin, an EDA volunteer who had who had no previous experience of management in the construction industry. But she did well, 
even if we lost a bit of money in that first venture. And within a few years, EDA, under Liz's guidance, leadership in the field, was, was holding its own, or doing better than many others in reconstruction, with contracts running into millions. Liz managed the field work, but aid work is not all field work. Field work. When George McNeil in Linlithgow looked after our accounts, our claims for repayment, the bank loans to float the enterprise before repayment was made, and negotiated the tortuous paths of the European Union and other bureaucracies funding the operation. Beatitude, beatific, soul destroying, will to live cancelling, but righteous, I guess. After Bosnia, Kosovo. This was a very new and very different chapter. Edinburgh Directorate took the initiative in forming an alliance of a small Scottish and one English charity styled the Scottish Charities Kosovo Appeal, SCKA. SCKA attracted the, was coordinated by EDA and attracted the support of Sir Tom Farmer and of Stephanie Wolf Murray and others of the Wolf Murray family who had started Scottish European Aid some years before. We had an amazingly successful fundraising concert in Glasgow which raised hundreds of thousands and Tom Farmer made available all his tire service stations for collection of goods and gave us access also to a huge warehouse at Straton. So SCKA began operating on a scale well above that which EDA alone can do, could do. Numerous 10 vehicle HGV convoys were sent, often with loaned trucks and seconded drivers. Many of these were led by David Reed's Greeks I referred to before. And they drove from Edinburgh via Italy and Greece, first to Albania, where a majority of the non-Serb Kosovans had fled to. Not only did we send many truck convoys, we also <coughs> chartered a 100,000 ton vessel, which was filled with all manner of supplies, including a forklift truck and a small tractor and heaven knows what, and sent to Durris docks in Albania, stored in a local warehouse and after some months transported to Kosovo, again in trucks led by David Reeks. It took some weeks before we realized that the accommodation we had rented for ourselves and the warehouse where our suppliers were, our supplies were stored were the property of a local mafia boss who had bestowed his favor upon us. What brought this home to us first was when a policeman came by complaining of something or other, the owner appeared and disappeared with the policeman for a short time, and when they came back, the policeman was bleeding from blows to his face and extremely cowed. It turned out also that the other half of the building in which we were accommodated was the local brothel. Well, Setting Albania to rights was not within our competence, nor within our mandate, but what to do? Seek other accommodation for persons and goods, probably incurring the wrath of the capo mafioso, or stay where we were, continuing to enjoy his dubious protection. Sorry to say, righteousness failed us, we stayed. But I put it to all. What would you have done? What should we have done? One thing is sure, is the beatitude it was not. In July 1999, NATO took action against Serbian forces and moved, moved the Kosovo, a Kosovo-backed government back in charge. And NGOs were able to follow. SCKA was one of the first on the scene, and after a short time, we were allocated responsibility for a part of, um, of the area of Mitrovica, which is on the border with Serbia, and was one of the most difficult parts. 
This venture was put in charge of Stephanie Wolf Murray, who did a most remarkable job, infusing everybody with enthusiasm, charming bureaucracy wherever it was needed, and incidentally scaring the pants of anybody who had the misfortune to be driven by her in a Land Rover with one, one arm out of the window holding her cigarette and absolutely ignoring obstacles which would have stopped anyone else. But Stephanie did a great job. And the goods continue to flow with, with flow from the UK, with contracts also from, there, from the EU and various others. For example, one con contract for repairing local tract repairing tractors, which had been damaged by during the conflict, enabling farmers to get back into operation. The largest of these contracts was for four hundred thousand pounds for building emergency shelters for the winter for those whose homes had been destroyed. This was a grant from Christian Aid, which we were amazed, delighted, and gratified to get. As we visited village after village, assessing where shelter was required, and trying to avoid supplying them to those whose Mercedes were hidden around the corner, we gained a somewhat better understanding of the context in which we were operating. My own personal experience included negotiating the purchase of about £100,000 worth of insulating panels. This was with the relation of the newly appointed Kosovan Prime Minister, whose son had volunteered to help us with this and that. When a price had been agreed, I was taken aback to be asked, <clears throat> how much would I like the invoice to be made out for? It slowly dawned on me that, me that this must be standard practice and they expected me to add 10,000 or 20,000 to the actual price for my own pocket. In that case, righteousness did prevail, but that was hardly difficult. As with Bosnia, reconstruction took over from emergency aid. Liz McLaughlin took over the management of the construction projects and George McDeal continued to negotiate the paths of bureaucracy and the accounts. On the whole, it was a good aid story, but it did not end on a good note. As things were winding down, Liz retired, another of our volunteers took over. A project he was working with was rebuilding houses in a, in a hill village near Mitrovica. Three, three of those had belonged to a group of, of Romanies, we might call gypsies, but they were not traveling people, they were settled. And one was in fact, or had in fact, been the village teacher. Our people there sought advice, as we always did, from UNHCR security, and one of their officers visited the village on a number of occasions. When the houses were ready, the men of the family, we invited the men of the family to go up and have a look and perhaps stay overnight and passed on the advice from UNHCR, UNHCR security that all was well. All was not well. All three <coughs> were murdered during the night, their throats cut. Where did that leave us? True, we followed UNHCR advice. Wherever the responsibility lay, beatitude it was not. After Kosovo, after Kosovo we did many other things. We worked in Sri Lanka after the Indian Ocean tsunami. We worked in Pakistan after the earthquake in 2005 and the floods following later. In Kenya, after what was a veritable epidemic of AIDS amongst people in the border towns between Kenya and U Uganda, especially the long distance drivers. And in Kenya, we had a project for AIDS orphans, as it were. Our general policy was that if there was a great need as a result of man-made or natural 
disaster. And there was a niche that a small organization like ours could fit into and make a worthwhile contribution. Then we would go for it. The biggest of those efforts at that time was in Pakistan, where our work was led by our, <coughs> our all-purpose wonder woman, Maggie Tukey, who was at this particular moment cycling back from, from Greece to, from, from southern, sorry, I should say from southern Italy to Skipton on a sponsored ride after spending two months in the chaos of Lebanon organizing our projects there. Maggie did all sorts of things in Pakistan, and one of the biggest and best of these, well, certainly the most dramatic of these, was the supply of a clinic to an isolated hill town. The earthquake had destroyed buildings all over the place. And in this particular mountaintop village, their clinic had actually fallen down the mountainside or been shooken down the mountainside. We sent out a number of containers, and one of the containers we'd actually bought so that we could keep it there. Usually, you just hire a container. And after some discussion, Maggie, who was there at the time with John Hume Robertson, you may remember, was the MP for East Lothian, came in a lot of convoys with us. Um, and Maggie and John had decided that the best thing to do, way of supplying the, the clinic would be to convert the container, that is to put in windows, doors, put in insulation, put in an additional roof covering to protect from the sun, and then equip it with plumbing and a toilet and examination couch and waiting room furniture, etc. All this was done, but the question was how to get the clinic which was, by the way, in Abbottabad, not far from where Osama bin Laden, Laden was lurking, it turned out, how to get it up to the village, which was, for which it was impossible to send a truck with a big trailer, a big container on. And so they visited a local UNHCR helicopter station where they knew there were some huge helicopters. And they tried to persuade them to deploy one of their enormous vehicles to deliver the clinic. It will probably not have worked, except that Richard Garstang, Richard <coughs> Garstang who was also working with us uh, from, from the World Wildlife Fund, as it happened, with whom we'd been cooperating there. And Richard was from South Africa and overheard one of the pilots speaking with a South African accent. So promptly addressed him in Afrikaans, and he said, hey, booty, meaning hi, buddy whereupon all was quickly resolved and a deal was rapidly sealed. And th there's an amazing video of Maggie being the first to rush down to take hold of the trailing ropes to guide the clinic from the helicopter hovering overhead, followed by the villagers who helped pull it into position, and then a long line of chanting locals push pulling it from one position to another until finally it was lodged. So the clinic was delivered where it serves to this day. Following which, the Ministry of Health in um, Kashmir, Pakistan control part of Kashmir, AJK as they call it, considered that EDA is the right source to turn to when they want a rural clinic. And indeed, we have managed to oblige on a number of subsequent occasions. I was never personally involved in Pakistan, but Jan and I visited in, I think it was 2009, and on arrival with the local man who managed our operation there under Maggie's direction, we were greeted by a large sign across the road saying, welcome Dennis, welcome Jan, welcome Edinburgh Direct Aid. That was a good moment. That was, can I, how, how much, how's the time going? Am I? Another operation we ran was in Kenya. This derived from a contact Maggie had with a small French-based 
based but English managed NGO. The project was led competently by one Nancy Onyango. It comprised an orphanage for about 50 children and a center where older widows might come, well, widows generally as a result of their husbands dying of AIDS, for company, for feeding, and for work when there was some. EDA didn't directly fund any, anything there. They didn't directly fund the orphanage, but we did fund projects connected with it. In particular, John Hume Robertson, his son Patrick, as well as Maggie were involved. John and Patrick installed a new water supply and we also set up a new electrics, electricity system and sent out a container which was to stay was duly converted into a useful, um, useful accommodation after a long tussle with the Kenyan government as to whether it should pay duty or not pay duty which was eventually resolved by one government department paying the duty to another on our behalf. Although I didn't take any part in the project, it was dear to my heart, as I had spent two years in Kenya, and in 1993 was part of a Mountain Club of Kenya party which hoisted the flag of the newly independent country on top of Mount Kenya on the eve of its independence in 1963. In 2013, there was the 50th birthday of Kenya, and there were much celebration. And a new generation of Kenyan climbers invited my companion on the time, Robert, and I to a celebratory ascent, if not the difficult higher peak of Batyan, at least the lower peak of Lenana in our case, which of course I was delighted to go to and took with me my stepson, who had been part of the climbing expeditions in his younger days, and took the opportunity of visiting, and, of visiting and trying to assess the project in Kisumu. The visit was great, but as I listened to Nancy and discussed with her the behavioral problems of the children and the future of the project, my heart sank. She was operating according to the norms of her country and her culture, the divide is great. Children were beaten, a bedwetter was forced to sleep in his wet bed, and so on. Do we have the right to impose our cultural norms on others? I don't know. But as those who are paying the piper, or at least part of the piper's fee, we can indeed call the tune or try to. And we did try, and at least had some superficial success. But there was another quite different problem there. The French NGO had negotiated a complex agreement with Nancy, which involved the provision of a home for herself as well as a space for the project. The Kenyan government was requisitioning the land to make way for a highway, and it soon became clear that the French NGO's contract with Nancy was by no means clear or watertight. And as things ended up, it was Nancy who got all the compensation and bought the replacement land, which had not been anyone's intention. But we were on the sidelines of that. But again, we were faced with the dilemma. To continue working with Nancy, who after all was doing something for the children, even if not always as we wished to, even if she was looking after her own interests in a way was borderline fraudulent, or should we walk away? Well, in this case, we weren't much involved. And we continue to, find a, to fund a small project there and continue now. This is simply the provision of good meals twice a week to the increasingly elderly remaining AIDS widows. And we do, do it even now. Again, what should we have done? What would you have done? And so to Lebanon. In 2013, wave after waves of refugees from Syria poured into the surrounding states and began to filter through Turkey across to the Mediterranean islands and through Greece into the EU. It was clear that Edinburgh Direct Aid had to respond in some way. 
John Hume Robertson and Maggie again went on a reconnaissance trip around the refugee camps in Turkey and Lebanon. In Lebanon, they came across the border village of Arsal. Arsal stands high in the hills above the Bekar Valley at an altitude of about 1,500 meters, that is somewhat higher than Ben Nevis, which gives rise to a climate in those latitudes which is extremely hot in summer and extremely cold in winter. Its population was, 3, 000, was 35,000 Lebanese. When the Assad regime began bombing the neighboring Kalamun region, refugees flooded across the border, a hundred thousand of them. Many have moved on, but there remain over 50,000 living in tents and various kinds of improvised accommodation. At the time of Maggie and John's visits, other, there were, no other NGO had a presence there. The need was evident. It became clear that it was a good place for EDA to work. It became and remains the main focus of our operations. In our cell, we have a center which comprises an office, a sewing workshop, a vocational training center. We've built schools and continue to maintain staff and manage one of them. We've sent many containers, comprising mainly clothes, all sorts of hand-knitted baby garments contributed by all sorts of things, including great numbers of hand-knitted garments, especially baby garments, contributed by an enthusiastic knitters all over the UK, um, who always post them not to our warehouse, which doesn't have a constant presence, but to our house, which gets inundated to this day by boss, box after box of knitting, which we're glad to have, but sometimes trip over. I'm glad to say that we no longer hand out unsorted boxes to beneficiaries. Instead, we run what we call a free shop, where goods are arranged on counters and on hangers, as in a shop, and refugees are invited by phone to visit at particular times, and they can treat and are generally treated more like customers than beneficiaries, which makes me feel a lot better about it. But now imagine a town with around twice as many refugees as there are inhabitants. It doesn't make for the best of relationships. Though it must be said that the refugees add to prosperity to, of some by way of rents and sales and expansion of business. But others have undoubtedly suffered because farmers especially will employ the refugees at a fraction of the rate at which they employ the locals. Official government policy in Lebanon is that all, all refugees can attend what they call share schools. That is, additional sessions at Lebanese schools. These are staffed by the same teachers who do the morning sessions. They are paid a bit, bit more, but that does not make them less tired or less irritable or more accommodating to their charges and many refugees withdraw from this type of schooling. But in any case, when there are nearly twice as many refugees as locals, there are simply not as much places, enough places. But there are many Syrian teachers amongst the refugees, and they often start, get together in groups and start informal schools. And these we try to support and have supported, as I said, by building one for another group and building one and maintaining one ourselves. Recently, the Lebanese government has clamped down on these informal schools and forbidden them. Well, they've always forbidden them, but enforced the prohibition. However, we and a few others have managed to find a way around this. <clears throat> we no longer run a school formerly called the 
future Syria school. It's now called the Scottish Education Training Centre. It doesn't have school uniforms. It doesn't do anything ostensibly school-like, but it does provide some training and education. And we have negotiated with the local police, so we are allowed to do it. One of the most, it's, it's not difficult for us to find the money for the rent, or for the heating oil, or for the electricity. But paying staff salaries, it's much more difficult because it's a relatively large and above all a recurring expense. Anyone with experience of seeking charitable grants will know that the hardest thing of all is to get funding for recurring and non-innovative non expenditure, especially salaries. We can use private donations, certainly, but we need them for everything. But one way or another, we have been able to pay the salaries of the teachers for some years now. But here's the dilemma. We're only able to do this because, by paying the, because we are paying the teachers at refugee rates, specifically around $200 a month, which in the refugee economy of our sale is reckoned a fair rate. Compare, for example, with UNHCR's grant of $27 a month per adult. Nevertheless, $200 for a teacher. Should we pay these derisory rates and continue to run the school, or should we try to pay the teachers at least the same as the Lebanese teachers? That is, the magnificent amount of $800 per month in which case we'd almost certainly have to close up shop. And what about pension provision and similar employment provisions? We, like other aid agencies, when we work for refugees, we're oriented towards short-term problems. But the Syrian refugees in Lebanon seem to be there for the long haul, as is the case with the Palestinians. So again, what should we do? Continue to contribute our tuppence worth, notwithstanding that we find ourselves in the position of bad employers, or give up and withdraw. Aid work is not the attitude. In some ways, Lebanon is to be complimented on its tolerance. Amongst the total of about three and a half million Lebanese that are now li living around one million Palestinians and one million Syrians. Actually, they bring a considerable country, income to the country because of UNHCR and other payments. Be that as it may, resentment of the refugees certainly exists and from time to time is exploited by politicians there as elsewhere. One of the most regrettable actions of the Lebanese government in recent times was a decree in 2019, or rather the enforcement of a decree, that refugees are not allowed to build permanent structures, quote unquote, for shelter. By a permanent structure, they mean anything with, a, with brick walls or block walls over one meter in height. Now, most, almost all the refugees living there long term have managed by use of savings or by small earnings to acquire more than a simple tent, a more solid roof, a partition wall, perhaps an extension. And suddenly they are ordered to demolish these or the government will send in the army with bulldozers to demolish them for them. They gave a deadline at the end of July and indeed the army was sent and did demolish as a, as a warning, a number of shelters in a number of camps, giving the people minimum time to rescue their goods and escape with their lives. And so the refugees set to demolishing their own homes and replacing with wood and plastic shelter materials, flimsy things supplied largely by 
um, Norwegian Res Rescue Committee and others. But although many of the refugees could do the work themselves, not all could. When it comes to think about the disabled and the elderly, and this is where we found we could give a help of a sort. There was one place near our office where there was a compound entirely inhabited by disabled and elderly people who could not manage the demolition or reconstruction themselves. So we sent in our own trained people, volunteers who are graduates of our um, vocational training scheme in construction, to do what? To knock down the, the walls and which had been pain, painstakingly built up and replace them with constructions which might or might not withstand the winter. Well, I don't feel guilty about that. It had to be done and we were helping. But all I can say is beatitude, it was not. So, I think I've made clear that aid work involves many moral dilemmas to which I certainly don't know the answer. One thing, however, one aspect of our work I've never found questionable, however, and that is the effect on the home front, so to speak. We run a we have a warehouse down in Granton where many volunteers turn up, give their time, their effort. Time after time, no matter what the conditions, sorting and packing, obeying the injunction that if you wouldn't wear it yourself, don't send it, coping with occasional lack of boxes somehow or other, coping currently with occasional lack of destinations due to great difficulty in sending things, and continuing in their enthusiasm and their work. And, and whenever we have needed volunteers, for whatever purpose, whether it's in this warehouse or our preceding ones, or doing fundraising events, or indeed going out to Bosnia or Lebanon or wherever it might be, I've been greatly moved by seeing what people want to do, like to do, and seeing also that they do benefit from it. And I think of that, I'm truly proud, without any hesitation or moral dilemmas. So while aid work might not be beatitude, it does have its rewards. Thank you. Thank you indeed, Dennis, for sharing with us the amazing breadth and depth of the work of Embra Direct Aid over the past 30 years, often in very complex and challenging and dangerous circumstances that you related some of the tragedies that have been involved too, um, and also the practical and the moral dilemmas that... Uh,